man as it is appointed unto man wants to die. But after this, the judgment. Okay, simple. And it is appointed to man wants to die. Every single one of you that are watching me right now. Think about somebody that you've lost over the years. Father, a mother, a brother, a sister, a relative, a friend. We could think of a grandparent, great-grandparent. We could think of someone that we have lost over the years. So where this scripture says, it's appointed unto man once to die. They died, they were buried, they never came back. They didn't take form in this body ever again. But after that, the judgment. Now, for years, we've heard this taught as the judgment of whether or not you go to heaven and hell. I don't want to get into that part today. <clears throat> but today, I want to talk about judgment of how did you live your life? Did you live your life to achieve the greatness and the fullness that God had for you? Or did the person live their life and die having never lived? It's appointed unto all of us once to die. And after that death comes the judgment. Now, I want to give you five pastors. I want you to listen to this. And I'm going to talk about myself. Again, men serving others is killing you. Now, I want you to share this message. Every spiritual leader, every pastor, every leader of your home, every leader of your community, every leader of your family, whether it be, you know, you're, you're, you're the patriarch. Whatever it may be, I want you to hear this message today because it is vital when serving others is killing me. Okay? Pastor John Gritton, affectionately known as Pastor G, he's pastor of the Christ Missionary Baptist Church. He announced his resignation in September and the church New Year's sermon Eve, uh, new, church's New Year Eve sermon of December 31st was his last day pastoring. Reverend Howard John Wesley of the historic Alfred Street Baptist Church, Alexander, Virginia. He's pastored there for the past 11 years, leading service every weekend. Y'all forgive me, I got his eyelashes keep getting in my eye. It's driving me crazy. And some of you ladies who wear lashes, and you know, I don't wear them, but it's just my naturals. <laughs> but he was leading service for every weekend, averaging 4,500 in attendance to 50,000 viewers online. California mega pastor, Gerard Wilson, who was a prominent advocate for mental health outreach. But then that was Pastor Andrew Stockland of the Inland Hills Church in Chino, California. He recounted the Old Testament story of prophet Elijah, whose desperate led prayer when he was praying and he led prayer for death. If you go back and read that prayer that Elijah talked about, he was filled with, the prayer was filled with anxiety, depression, and suicidal thoughts. And last, Pastor Teddy Parker of Bill Mount Zion Baptist Church, Macon, Georgia. He stated, I don't feel like God is hearing me. And on November the 10th, 2018, Parker sent his family on to church as he stayed behind. And he said, I'll be there to meet you but he never showed up. He never arrived to service to preach that morning. Why is this message so important? Why did I just give you just five of many thousands of preachers? Because four out of five of those preachers that I named, okay, of uh, three out of five, excuse me, experienced suicide and five of five experienced spiritual burnout. Mental health was the struggle. Now, why is this important? And why am I saying that it's important unto man once to die and after that the judgment? And why did I open up with five pastors, prominent pastors, who have experienced what many are experiencing this very Sunday morning, spiritual burnout? It's because they live a life and they, they took an oath to serve the people of God. They took an oath to minister and, and to be the leader to thousands. They took an oath to preach God's word in season and out of season. But what happened is when serving others is killing you, they didn't do the most important thing. 
They didn't know how to serve themselves. See, this whole month of January 2020, the way Life Center is focusing on self-care, putting yourself first. There are many people this morning that are dressing up right now to go sit in a pew saying, I need my New Year's Day service message. I need my new message for this year. I need that message that the pastor is going to give this Sunday that's going to direct the rest of my life. But that pastor is looking in the mirror, struggling because he's tired or she's tired. The pastor's struggling because they just you know, had watch night service a few months, a few days ago. And, and now they're really saying, but I'm tired. I don't want to go to church. I, I want to get away. I want to go to an island and, and I want to let my hair down. I want to take my shirt off and enjoy the rays. I want to walk on the beach and let my feet walk in the water and upon the sand. But they can't do it. They can't do it because they are serving others who needs a word from the pastor whose life hinges on the very words that come from his or her mouth. They're saying, but pastor, if you don't preach this Sunday, I'm not coming. So the pastor has to watch this now. Look at the finances of the church dwindle because he can't take a break or she can't take a break because people won't come to church if they're not there. Oh, I didn't join the church for the assistant pastor. I didn't join the church for the missionary leader or the evangelist leader or the deacon. I joined the church for you, preacher, because you spoke a word that drew me. See, pastors and leaders are dying while serving others because they don't have the ability to take a break. Because to take a break will mean they lose everything. There, there are churches that have to pay their finances every month and it's due upon people giving. But if the leader is not there to preach, people don't give. Let's just be real about it. This is pulling back the veil and sharing with you 36 and 37 years of ministry. What I've seen and what I've experienced. Or they feel as though once they take the oath of the cloth that they can never quit because to quit on God is, wow, death. And so they feel the pressure to perform. Somebody need to type that on the screen, pressure to perform. See, when a pastor or a leader, and some of you can experience this as being leaders of your own home, let's take it away from just you know serving the leadership outside of the walls. Let's take it to your own home. As a father, as a mother, you don't go to work, your, your kids won't have the lights and the water. Or this past Christmas, you felt the pressure to perform because you wanted your family to experience a great Christmas. And here it is, you work yourself to the bone. No vacation, no time off for you because you're busy serving others, but it's killing you. You're making sure your husband is fine. You're making sure your wife is fine. You're making sure your children are fine. You feel the pressure to perform. And while you're feeling the pressure to perform, you're dying because the most important person is not experiencing true service. That is you. Something I noticed about Jesus throughout the Bible, it says many a times Jesus sent others away and he got to himself. Now, whether he was meditating, praying or just chilling or chillaxing, as we like to say, we don't know. But what we do know is Jesus understood the necessity of getting away by himself. Oh, he felt the pressure to perform. Jesus comes. Here's the woman with the issue of blood. Jesus comes to a city. The boy is infected with a demon and, and the, they want him to cast him out or the sick and the shed ain't come. Or Lazarus is dead and he's your friend. You're pressured to come and perform this miracle to raise him from the dead. See, Jesus, but he yet understood that I need to send you guys away. I need you to get away from me and I need some me time. I need some time to myself because of the pressures of life. And he was Jesus Christ. He was God in flesh. So who are we? So if he needed time to regroup, to refocus, to rejuvenate, then why is it that we can allow the pastors and the leaders time to go? Oh, I give them a couple of days. No, baby. It may take six months. I remember preaching for Bethesda Christian Center, the church that we started from the ground up 13 years. 
And I remember going through a divorce. I remember going through hard times. I remember going through a lot of stuff, whether I caused it or other caused it. Because, you know, people like to say, oh, you had something to play in it. Well, whether I did or didn't, it doesn't matter. It's the pressure to perform. An apostle, a leader who's raising people. You know, people come to the service, need a word from God. People come, uh, need healing. I wouldn't see certain people until they needed a healing. Then they show up and say, I got an issue. Apostle, can you pray? Can you lay hands? You know, people come when they need something. And as leaders, you can't just shun people away because you know they're using you. You have a job to do by God. So you still pray, right? So I remember many times not wanting to preach, not wanting to pray. I remember winning 250 and losing 189, I mean, uh, dropping from 250 to 189 because of my stress and struggles that I was dealing with internally. And people say, well, pastor, you should have took a break. But how? The moment I don't show up is the moment the finances dropped. And every month, the bills that are due for the church fell upon me to pay. Didn't fall upon the congregation. If somebody got mad with some other person in the church and wanted to leave, it's my responsibility to make it smooth because why? I'm feeling responsible to serve servants. And I recall when I'm sitting there losing this weight, clothes falling off of me, getting sick, thinking about having to eat just food. I recall people saying, but pastor, you don't look good. What's wrong? The devil's after you. The blood of Jesus. It wasn't the blood of Jesus I needed. It wasn't the devil. It was Carrie Anthony Pope needing to take a mental break from everything because he was dying. Somebody better hear me this morning. He was dying. He being me was dying. There are preachers right now who are about to take the pulpit. There are leaders right now that are telling you to open your Bible to such and such and such and such who are dying right before your eyes. There are a lot of walking dead right before your eyes because of the pressure to perform because you need them. But what do they need? And listen, and I don't care what leader tells you that, oh, I don't need, a, God got me, Jesus got me. That's that foolishness that has been embedded in us from day one is cast your problems to the Lord. He's able to work it out. No, God gave you common sense to know how to shed it, how to cut it down, how to say, look here, I refuse to go to my grave because let me tell you what people are going to do. You're going to be dying to serve. You're dying because you're serving. Then you're going to look up, you're going to get this diagnosis from the doctor saying your health is bad or your children are going to neglect you because you've never spent that time with them because you were too busy serving church. I wish somebody hit me, hear me now because I'm speaking from experience. I look up at my oldest daughter is going to be 32 this year. My son is going to be 30, 32. I'm sorry, 30. I'm looking at the years that went by because I'm serving, but yet not serving who was most important, which is my children. Somebody better hear me this morning. And then you got the pastor's wife who's sitting here being the, 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 uh, the, the, the dartboard or the, the bullseye for hatred, to be the bullseye for jealousy, to be the bullseye because she doesn't look the part. She doesn't look good enough to be his wife. She doesn't seem to be his right rib. So you got all these little women that are, that are battling or men that are battling to be the next one because the current one is struggling. Somebody better hear me this morning. And this is all happening while the leaders having to juggle and having to keep balance because servanthood is what he's been taught or she's been taught. I wish someone would hear me. Look what she said. Come on now. That was me. I was so resentful towards my father. Thank you for your honesty, Crystal. My daughter and my son suffered as a result of me trying to serve others without serving myself and my family. I remember my daughter saying to me, Dad, I wish you would serve me or love me like you love all the other ones that call them yourself, uh, that call themselves your daughter. That thing hurt me because I thought I was loving her. I thought I was serving her, but the reality was I wasn't. I didn't, I didn't catch the small thing because I was too busy trying to get a word from God to help others. See, when serving you is killing me, when serving others is killing you, Let's be honest this morning, many of you right now, you'll be okay with just life in its simplicity. 
But because of the pressure to perform, you're feeling as though unless you have these accolades and these, 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 these great things about you, that you're not successful. There are so many people that are dying right now. And then the judgment comes. Oh, she wasn't all that. He wasn't all that. He wasn't a good father. She wasn't a good mother. They were too busy praying for everybody and going to the hospital to see the sick and the shut in. They were too busy giving their money to the people. They was bringing in strangers. And while they was tending to them, I was being alienated. I wish I had some honest people to speak to this morning. While serving others is killing you. And so in 2015, God told me to shut down Bethesda Christian Center. 13 years of ministry built from the ground up. I felt personal defeat. Uh, I had a lot of things that I did right. I had a lot of things that I did wrong. And in the midst of shutting it down, feeling like a failure, God told me, now I'm going to teach you how to live. It blew me away because I thought living was doing the will of the Father, serving others, making sure that people stand up and be correct in what they say, the, thus said the Lord, and making sure that people prophesy under the right way, and then seeing in the, the future for people's lives and speaking into their lives. And God said, that's not living, that's performing. Many people that you think are successful are successful performers but failures of life. I'll say it again. Many that you have deemed great and successful are professional performers, but they have failed at the simplicities of life. When God told me to shut down Bethesda, again, I struggled. I, I, I felt just like I failed God. Apostle, shutting it down. Many looking at him. Blaming the new wife. <laughs> yeah, they blame Rebecca. They say he didn't change till he got married. Well, guess what? If you want to blame her for making me, uh, and she didn't make me. If you want to say she made me change, then go right ahead because I know the truth. You don't. The reality wasn't that it was her, but it looked this way, perception, because this is a mighty man of God who was raising people from the dead and he's prophesying. And he would, I watched him go through a divorce and lose weight and he didn't quit then. I should have, but I felt the pressure to perform. And so as I got married, one thing I can truly say Rebecca taught me was how to live. So when you want to say that, say that. And I'm going here for a reason, because people look for who to blame when change comes upon someone's life. People look for someone to point fingers at and say, oh, it didn't happen till he got with her. Carlton Pearson, when he changed, oh, it was his wife that caused him to change when Carlton was already changing. If truth be told, half, if not probably, no, not even half, probably 95 to 98% of my change happened before Rebecca. And when I told her stuff, she's shaking her head like, oh my God, you going to do what? Because I was sharing with her my spiritual burnout. When God told me, I'm going to teach you how to live. Teaching me how to live means the end of life as you know it. Somebody better hear me this morning. When God says he's going to teach you how to live, that means the end of life as you know it. And this morning, as we go into this new year, as we go into this new series of self-care, understand it's okay to start over. It's okay to close the chapter of that book and to open up another book with a new title. It's okay to say it's over and think what you want to think, mistakes and all. It's okay. Listen to me, ladies and gentlemen. You don't owe anybody an explanation of what you did right, what you did wrong. You don't owe, any, owe anyone an explanation of what you got right, what you got wrong. You don't owe anyone an explanation of who stayed, who left, why they left, why they stayed. Stop it. In 2020, it is time for you to start serving yourself because in serving others, it's killing you. You have forgot just what it feels like to watch a movie and laugh because you're too busy saying that's me in the movie. 
You're too busy saying that's me. That's my life on screen. It is time for us to stop being professional performers. It is time for us to be happy, to live, and to laugh. Those pastors that I brought to you have stood before and have been responsible for thousands and thousands of souls. But the most important soul that they did not govern was their own because they experienced mental burnout. You know, mental health. Let's talk about mental health. There's a lot of people that are struggling mentally, struggling mentally. Uh, you may say, well, my New Year's resolution is to go to the gym, to lose weight, to get into shape because the weight that I'm carrying doesn't feel good on my body. Good, because you need to shift that now to the weight that I'm carrying on my mind. The weight that I'm carrying mentally is too heavy for me to care to carry. It's too heavy for me to keep caring about because it's straining me. These pastors experience mental health issues because if you carry something longer than you should, it will start to infect you mentally. It will affect how you think. It will affect how you process. And once your mind is affected by it, then everything else follows. I wish I had some help this morning. So with that being said, God is calling us to a mental shift, mental health, people committing suicide daily. Just a kid the other day just signed his letter of intent to play for Georgia, uh, Georgia Tech. And he ends up a few days after the greatest moment of his life walking on a train track and being hit by a train because he committed suicide. Life was too hard. And so we have to stop feeling as though I'm responsible for you. <laughs> you got to stop feeling like you're responsible for others. Only person that I'm responsible for is myself and my, my wife because I married her and my daughter Kiera because she's my baby that I'm yet to raise. But as you get children to an age to now accountability where they can carry themselves, then their responsibility falls off you and falls on them to learn how to walk and you help undergird them if they need advice. You're not responsible for grown people. I'm gonna say it again, every leader, every pastor, you don't, you may, if you don't like it, that's your privilege, that's your prerogative, you can click off and not watch me ever again. But I'm going to say this. You are not responsible for grown people. Somebody type that on the screen. I'm not responsible for grown. I'm not even responsible for what Rebecca and the choices she make. I'm responsible to be a husband and to be a provider and to be a protector. But I'm not responsible for the decisions that she make. I'm responsible for Kiera because she's underage and can't fend for herself and can't provide for herself. But my grown children, I'm responsible to help guide them. Somebody better hear me this morning because you feel responsible for everybody and they're chilling back going, yeah, you're responsible for me. Where's my food? Where's my advice? Where's my insight? Oh, I need you to pay this for me. I need you to pay that for me. Time out. Stop killing yourself for people. You're not responsible for grown people. Leaders that are preaching somewhere in the pulpit this morning. Those people in the, in, the, in, the, in the pews are not your responsibility. They have their own responsibility. It's appointed unto man once to die. And then after that, the judgment. I'm not your responsibility. And I would never go another day feeling as though I'm responsible for your spiritual well-being. The Bible says study to show yourself approved. It didn't say that I have to approve you, but study. We've been given this responsibility that people are responsible, that these souls are your responsibility. No, they're not. And I'm going to tell you this morning, you that are watching me are not my responsibility. You can choose to walk away at any time you get ready. You can choose to click the off button any time you get ready. And how is it I'm responsible for your decision? No, I'm responsible to give the truth that God has given me. And to be honest with you, if most people give their truth, then your truth is your truth. People say, well, it doesn't line up with this, a line up with that. Well, I don't care what it doesn't line up with. It's my truth. If I hit my toe and my toe is throbbing in pain, I'm in pain. That's my truth. 
Someone tells you, oh, you shouldn't feel that way. It doesn't hurt that bad. You're not me. And that's the problem. You have tried to be what people want you to be. And you're not acknowledging that I'm dying, that I'm hurting, that I'm struggling. Come on, who can be transparent with me this morning and be like I am? Say, Carrie, I can relate because I have served others, but I never served myself. I feel guilty when I buy myself something. I feel guilty if I think about putting myself first. I feel guilty if I buy the smallest of the smallest just so I'll feel good because everybody else is saying, but well, they need this pair of shoes and they need this, this pair of pants. So they wanted this. Come on, these might talk to me this morning. And so to every leader, every leader of a spiritual entity or your personal entity, you're not responsible for grown people. Now, if you choose to take responsibility for them, then that's something you choose to do. <laughs> Somebody did not hear me this morning. I'll take another sip of my coffee because I, I, I need some transparency this morning. Because some of you right now are going into 2020 feeling like you got a, this pressure to perform, this pressure to be all. No. Let me give you an, uh, uh, an analogy. You know, back in the days when there were slaves who would uh, serve the master and, and they would set the table, they would make sure the finest china was out. They would make sure that the forks were in play, place and the knives and the spoons were in place and the silverware set perfectly. They'll make sure that there's the big saucer, the small saucer, the, the, all, the, all the etiquette that goes into setting up for service. And then the people would come in and then they would serve them, all right? A1 service. But then the slave is served and doesn't feel worthy. Wait a minute, wait a minute. They set out to find China and they said, no, give me the plastic plate. They set out the perfect forks and knives and spoons. They said, no, give me the plastic ones. They set out the China. You okay with a cup that is plastic or one that is not real? Because you don't know how to be served, but you know how to serve. And so what happens is you give care to everyone else because as a slave mentality, you've been taught how to serve. Somebody better hear me this morning. You better get this. You have the slave mentality that I'm a servant not to be served. I'm not. And get this, ladies and gentlemen, people that are served feel the, they feel privileged. In other words, when you serve someone, that person that's being served get this special feeling inside it that I'm important. And watch this. And when they're not served in the, in, in the excellence that you're supposed to be served in, now they punish the server. Oh, hear me here. If the glass has one spot, then the whole table is terrible. See, slaves back in the... I, I remember watching... Uh, Bo, uh, um, um, what's the analogy of the, the movie? Uh, Django. The Django. And when they were serving, how everything had to be in place and how Samuel Jackson was the one that made sure everything was right. But yet, when they went behind the door, they were eating on basically nothing but scraps. See, many of you right now are taking your best and giving to leaders and doing, taking the best you have and serving others. But yet, you don't have yourself. I wanted you to hear me this morning. In 2020, serve yourself. Be a blessing to your own self. Take yourself to the spa. Take yourself to a vacation. Take yourself somewhere. Do something for you. Even on today, do the smallest thing for yourself today. We must stop feeling like others are privileged and entitled to things, but we're not. See, when serving others is killing you. I wish somebody hear me today. People have become so entitled to where when you don't serve them, then they talk about you or they make you feel so guilty. That's over in 2020. Listen to me very carefully. I've done more than you that I've done for my own self. But this year, somebody better say shift. Mental health becomes the first thing that people do. If I can't beat you physically, I'll beat you mentally. And so you go through mental abuse because you don't feel that you can perform. I can't compete with the others. I can't compete with the gift giving. I can't compete with the specialties. No, 
Time out. This year is about self-care. I refuse to be a pastor for the Way Life Center that doesn't understand what it means to take Rebecca off to an island. I'm going to tell you right now, one of the things, and you can hear this, we, we've established, and this came when God said, now I'm going to teach you how to live. First of all, never get to a place in life where you depend on other people to pay for what God has given you. Okay, I'll say it again. Listen to me very carefully. This is deep. Never depend on people to pay for what God told you to do. Why am I going there? Because I told Rebecca, and Rebecca, we both talk about it. When we started the Way to Life Center, one of our major concerns is normality. Losing normality. Losing being normal. Not able to go and take trips. Not able to have a great time. Not able to not have a Sunday worship service because people are going, but I need my food. Well, guess what? One of the things about the Way Life Center, that will not be service every Sunday. People say, well, what? Because you're not going to tie me down to working on Sunday for you when I can't enjoy myself on a vacation. People say, I don't know about that. Oh, yeah, because what's going to happen is this. When you learn how to self-care, then others won't be so dependent on you because they know the philosophy. The popes are going to put themselves first, but yet they're teaching me how to live that life. They're teaching me how to be honest to myself and to live. So stop enabling people to kill you because what you're actually doing when you don't give self-care is giving people a gun to kill you with called control. Is this message blessing you this morning? Because you have to, that's it. Kenya said it best. There has to be balance. And for 30 something years of ministry, I did not have balance. When God said shut Bethesda down, God gave me balance. And people said, well, you're an apostle. And where are you? I'm an apostle whether I'm on every Sunday or sitting on the beach drinking a margarita. People said, Margaret, yes, because stop faking the funk. Some people of today are drinking more than the people that are out here. And then they're saying, but pastors don't do this and pastors don't do that and pastors don't dance. And the other night, I felt it in the spirit so strong. I put a, a video up of me and Rebecca having a fun night of playing cars, hand and foot having a blast. And I felt the spiritual people going, oh my God, an apostle playing cards on Facebook. Well, guess what? That same ability you had to click on, you can click off because I don't care. I'm at a point where I'm going to live my life. And guess what? If you like it, cool. If my thing makes you fall, then stop watching because I refuse to put myself in a box to meet the quote of, hey, he's an apostle. Baby, I'm an apostle whether I give you a word or not. How you perceive me doesn't change who I am with God. Who I am with God has been approved by God, not by you. So with that being said, I'm not going to serve you while dying. No, baby, I want to live. And if your thought of me dies, then good. Because you need to see me for who I am, which is a whole man, strong mentally. Because it came after learning how to live. There are so many people that are going to watch this video and they're going to privately share it to say, see, I told you. Share it, baby. I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because you wasn't with me in any way. And when people sit, when people sit this little share stuff around about you or they say this about you or they copy screen or uh, screenshot what you said or your post, they're not with you, baby. They're against you. And half the people you think are with you are actually against you. They're just using you because you're serving them. I'll pause for the cause. This is a real message this morning. This is not one of those little cookie cutters. This is a message of separation. It's from you understanding that in this year, I refuse to serve people who are not on my team. Either your team carry or you on your own. You either you either with me or against me. There's no balancing. There's no in between. And you have people who will be on your side. Listen, ladies and gentlemen, I hear God speaking clearly. They'll be on your side when it's for their benefit. But once they benefited from you and got from you what they need, I said, La Vista, baby, they'll drop you like a bad habit. 
I have experienced it in the name of Jesus. From leaders, I've experienced from congregationists, people in the congregation, I've experienced from people in general. People will suck you dry like a leech, like a tick. They'll lick, they'll, 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 they'll get on to you. They'll clap into you. They'll suck the very life of you. And when they get full and happy, they'll drop off and they'll talk about you. I wish somebody would say, I'll pause. Y'all listen, this is where you say that boy is telling the truth. Because so many times you're trying to live a life that people can praise you. Baby, they don't care what you do. They're not praising you. You know what I found out through my own personal experience is people will be so happy for you when you're with them or saying what they want you to say. And the moment you shift to start living your own life, the devil is using you or something has happened. No, what has happened is I have awakened to the fact that serving others is killing me. See, it's appointed unto man once to die. When I die, and I will, and many of you may come to the, if you're still alive, will come to the service and you'll say, I remember this and I remember that. And they're going to give some people three minutes to get up and say what they got to say. If it's one of those Pentecostal funerals, everybody's going to shout around and do all this other stuff. But is that benefiting me? Is anything you say at my funeral benefiting me? Why don't you stop for a second? Because some of the ones that you are living for and actually dying for right now, they're not going to come. They're not going to come. They're going to remember something that you did. They're going to remember something that didn't go quite the way that it should have gone. Some are going to not show up because they never got the apology from you that they felt that you should have given. Some are not going to come because they felt like you're not the person you used to be, that this new person they don't know, so they're not coming. But is that benefiting you? Stop for a second. I want everyone to really get this understanding when serving others is killing you. Are the words that have been spoken over your body benefiting you in any way at all? No. What people say at your funeral cannot add or take away from you, period. But why are we dying for people that won't die for you? I'll take a sip out of my Georgia cup on that one. The leaders that I named, the ones that committed suicide, Reverend Parker, people said he's going to hell because he committed suicide. And especially as a man of God who should have known better, he is burning right now in hell. How dare you? judge somebody who was already living in hell because he was trying to perform for people who could not allow him to live. He had a wife. He had a church. He was struggling just to survive. How dare you judge somebody because they didn't live up to your expectations. Is this a real message? This message this morning I pray is putting a fire in your stomach that is making you say bump people that if you don't, if you're not with me, that means you're against me. And let me say this to you. If you're not paying my bills, if you're not buying my food, putting gas in my car, then why am I coming to serve you when you can't come to serve me? How many birthdays do you have? But nobody's being a gift giver to you. But yeah, every time their birthday comes around, you've been a gift giver to them. I pray that this fire is burning in you this morning to say, hold up. When serving others is killing me. It's killing me. It's killing your bank account. It's killing your self-esteem. Why should you die for people? that are not willing to die for you. I recall taking spiritual bullets for people, praying and casting out demons and they're going home, we're delivering, I'm coming home fighting. But then the moment they heard something else glorious, they booked away. I remember people die. I remember just, 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 just dying inside. 
And while I'm dying, they're planning their escape. They're planning their next victim. 2020 is about waking up and having a real come to Jesus moment where you look around and you put things in proper perspective. Is anyone perfect? No. But if serving others is killing you, then that means you're responsible for your own self-care. Parker, his only way Reverend Parker saw out of this world was suicide. The, the other pastor, he was a mega pastor. Let me give you his name again. When you have Jared Wilson, who killed himself last year, and he was an advocate about mental health but he was preaching from his internal struggles. I remember struggling myself, feeling like a failure because I couldn't live up to the expectations of the congregation and seeing people leaving because they want to go to a better place where the pastor is more stronger. He's not going through a divorce or he's not losing weight. He's not struggling or she's not struggling. I remember having to get up every Sunday morning and push myself to church to preach to people that are talking about me. I remember. I want people to hear me this morning. When I see the numbers are going up and down, the numbers, on, that, they don't matter to me this morning. To be honest with you right now, because some got off because they're saying, oh, he's having this, or some got off. It doesn't matter about the numbers. Because the ones that are listening, that know this is the truth, they're staying. Because they're saying, Carrie, they're leaving because they have been offended. They're leaving because you have exposed. They're leaving because they know that. See, the Bible says you should know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Make you free means the truth of my life. It's not the truth of everyone else's life. It's your truth. It's your truth. Jared Wilson, prominent pastor. Preach, preach, preach preached, but he took his life and left behind was his wife to grieve, his family to grieve and people to talk. Watch this. His wife saw his struggles. His wife saw his sacrifices. His children felt it. The pressure to perform every Sunday, to stand before people, to look the part, to sound the part, to not show a crack in your armor, not to show any vulnerability. To be a demon slayer. Let's bring it to the prophetic realm now. And the apostolic. To cast out demons. And to lay hands. And to raise the sick. To, to, to heal the sick. And to raise the dead. People that, that were under my ministry. And I remember at one while. When people used to come to Bethesda. There was some great healings. People coming in wheelchairs. And getting up walking. Miracle weight loss. For a, a gentleman that needs to lose weight. To have a surgery. The videos on YouTube. Lay hands. And his clothes start to fall off of him. Those who had sat under me for years saw the demons cast out, saw the miracles performed, saw a mother, uh, Arlene Green's mother, Mother Green, who died on a Friday night service. And God said, Carrie, she's dead. And I looked and her eyes were set in her head. And God had me to lay hands and he raised her from the dead till she lived another two or three years afterwards. Until the night they called me that God said, release her to come to me. And I was at the hospital the night when God said, now she's coming home. I remember a young lady that came to the church, pastoral anniversary. And she said, and God had me to get the mic and said, young lady, God said, what is it that you want? And she said, the only thing I want is to take these braces off my leg because she was deformed from birth. And I want to dance like everybody else. And I remember saying, by the power of God, take that brace off and dance now. And because she trusted the words of God and saw the power of God, reached down, took the brace off and went to dance and the church went up. I can, can't, I can name countless of events that we experienced at Bethesda alone. But where are the people today? They're not here because they said, I changed. I quit. I left. I changed. I gave up. No, I experienced spiritual burnout. I experienced living life for everybody, but couldn't perform a miracle for myself. I experienced dying. One of the greatest magical tricks I could perform was dying before your very eyes. But yet what people say is, 
he changed. He's not the same. He left his first love. They start all the spiritual scriptures and all this analogies and all this discerning. Well, if you can discern so well, then why you didn't discern that I was dying? Now, I'm, I'm, I'm saying this for a reason. I'm not, I'm not calling one person out. I'm just giving, I'm giving you the whole totality. If people can discern so much, why are they not discerning that you're dying? That this is not a devil thing. That this is not a life thing. That this is a servanthood thing. That, I, that you've given all your last to others and you're dying. Come on, this is a real message this morning. I tell you from, from the beginning, this will be a transparent message. Well, the veil will be pulled back. Now, I'm not complaining. Not one bit. I'm happy. Very happy. But I use these prominent pastors and my own personal experience to tell you that people are dying because they're serving others and they're not serving themselves. The Reverend uh, John Wesley, Howard John Wesley, this man has preached in front of Obama and various others. He's preached prominent messages for years. And I mean, people, I think about 50,000 people tuning in to watch. I mean, I'm just glad to have a thousand. 50,000 tune in every week to watch. The pressure to perform. He stood up and it took a lot of courage to say, I can't do this anymore. He said, I feel so far away from God. Come on, somebody. I remember struggling mentally my own self, my mental illness talking to me. It's not that I was sick, but I was becoming sick because I was too busy serving and not serving me. And then people say, oh, something, you don't look right. What's wrong? I'm going to pray for you. Really? The reason I'm sick the reason I'm losing weight or I'm looking tired is because I was up all night fighting your demons. I was up all night praying for your family while my family's over here sleep saying, come to bed. I, I was up getting a message because I needed God to speak a profound word because if I give you a word you've heard before, you'll go, oh, he said this on this day. Here's the notes. No, I've learned how to say no. I've learned how to let my phone, you know, I pay for this service every month. I pay for it. There's a service I pay for every month and I pay for it religiously. I mean, I pay for it. And God said, you need to start using the service you pay for. And this service I pay for is called voicemail. Because when people call, you don't have to answer. When people call, you can let that service you pay for called VM voicemail. Because what I found out is a lot of these people call, but when I didn't answer, they didn't leave a voicemail, which says it wasn't important to you. Because if I could just hear the voice of apostle that's like touching him as garment, I'll be made whole. Somebody better hear me this morning. I'm going to set up on this one. If I could just, but yet talk to apostle. If I could get him to say all is well, if he could just give me a word. If I could but just touch the hem of his garment, meaning hear his voice, then all would be made whole. But God said, let him talk to voicemail. You focus on what's important. Just because people call doesn't mean you have to answer. Somebody should say, wow. Just because people call or beckon for your attention does not mean you have to give it. And you will be no less of a person to do it. If anything, you're taking back control. You're taking back parts of your life. The Bible says, don't cast your pearls among swine. For they will tear your words up. They'll tear your pearls up and then they'll turn on you. Stop casting your pearls, which in this case is your servanthood, to people who will not appreciate it. Is this message blessing you this morning? It is time out for giving your life to people again that won't give their life to you. They won't die for you. They'll look for another sucker to suck on. Oh, I played the role of a sucker. The Bible, that song said, everybody plays a fool sometimes. There's no exceptions to the rule. And I had to come to understand this. I had to come to understand that the only person responsible for Kerry Anthony Pope is Kerry Anthony Pope. 
That's it. Rebecca says, I'm gonna see this right here. This is this is Kika. She been with me. She says, I remember our date night when you would still answer calls from people. Hold on. From people who just wanted to vent. The old carry is gone. Rebecca remember those days. She remember those days. And and you know, some of the ones that I died for. I see them now. They don't even comment on your post. They don't like anything. And God even showed me them taking screenshots. And I said, they're taking screenshots and sending it to other people. And I laugh because my gift is sharper today than it's been ever. And I, but, 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 the, but the difference is it doesn't bother me anymore. If anything, it told me to stop casting my pearls amongst the swine. A pig would eat anything. A pig would eat anything. Thing that you put down when they're hungry for attention, when they're hungry for acceptance. A pig will eat anything when they're hungry because all they're about is slop. I remember growing up, my grandfather taking the old food from the school and bringing it home and feeding it to the pigs. And, <coughs> excuse me. And the food was a throwaway from someone else. But the pigs will eat it. And catch this now, ladies and gentlemen. And the reason why a pig is fed slop is because I need this pig to become fat so I can kill it. Because I'm going to kill it for food. What are you saying, Carrie? Thank you speaking for speaking now, Holy Ghost. God said a lot of the swine that you're casting your pearls in front of are taking your scraps or your past or your failures or your trash and they're eating it, regurgitating it to other people who are nothing but swine. They're all getting fat, but they fail to understand that they're getting fat for the slaughter. That the slaughter that's going to take place is their very world is going to come to an end when God brings them from their highness for judging you. Did he not say that he will make your enemy your footstool? Did he not say that they, I, that I prepare the table in the presence of my enemies? But you thought the enemy was the person that was outside of your home? No, most times it's the people that are inside of your, 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 your comfort zone, the people you invited into your life, your church, your family, your friends, your love. That's where the swines are. What are you saying, Carrie? I'm saying God said it's time out for you worrying about people who don't like you. It's time for you to wake up and stop serving people who don't deserve to be served by you. Let somebody else serve them. Because whether you know it or not, they're finding somebody else to talk about because a dog that tears a bone, or they say a dog that brings a bone, carries a bone. But there's a lot of people that bring stuff to you because I think you should know. But while they bring you what I think you should know, they're taking away from you and they think, Others should know. Oh, yeah, I, I saw her. I talked to her. Yeah, she looked stressed. She looked like you really, you know, she said this. She said that. You got some undercover snitches that are bringing bones and taking bones. Y'all better get happy on that message. I'm, I'm done. I'm almost finished. I'm have five more minutes. There are a lot of snitches that are sitting in Sunday service this morning, taking back what the pastor said. There are a lot of snitches that are sitting in service, looking at people saying, he said, she said, they said. They didn't come to church. Evidently, they left. He came by himself, so evidently they're broke up. They're broken up. Or she is by herself. Evidently, he left. He must have done something. He must have cheated. She must have cheated. It ain't none of your business what they did. Stop being a snitch. I'm done. When serving others is killing you. I hope this message has quickened something in your spirit. If you came in late, go back and watch it in its entirety. Share it. People need to hear that. But it's time out for the undercover snitches. It's time out for the pressure to perform. It's time out for not feeling the part. It's time out. For casting your pearls among swines. Snitch, they would say snitches, snitches get stitches. Well, these I ain't got time to eat if you get stitches. Uh uh. I am too busy living my life. 2020, you will see me and Rebecca on somebody's beach, somebody's island, enjoying life. If it's too much for you to bear, unfriend me. If it's too much for you to deal with, unfriend me today. I'm not worrying about what you think. Because what people say is, don't let your good be evil spoken of. Well, baby, my good is my good. And I can't control who evil speaks about it. <laughs> 
Y'all better hear me this morning. Don't let your good be evil spoken of. Don't let the, don't let, you know, don't, no, no. Listen, my social media will be used to promote unity and love and blessings and abundance. My social media will be about showing how to live life and have it more abundantly. And if people can't handle it, then that same button that you hit to friend me is the same one you can hit to unfriend me. Because at the end of the day, you ain't coming to my funeral and you showed up not paying my bills. Why am I saying that, Carrie, to you? Because we have to stop it. It is time out for serving others while it's killing you. I pray this message. It's a strong message. And I'm sure some of my snitches are going to hit share and send it. That's okay. Hit it, baby. I, I give you permission. Hit it. Hit it. Press it. Send it. But while you're sending it, it's just one more freedom that I'm experiencing. When serving others, it's killing you. Amen? So, January 26, 11 a.m. We want to meet you in person. We want to see you for our love fellowship. Rebecca placed it up there. And now I want to shift to prayer. Father God, I glorify you. I glorify you for this morning's message, for it is one of necessity. It is one of true necessity in setting the pace for 2020. When serving others is killing you, self-care. Father, I pray that this message was received in the love that it was giving, but I also pray God that it's receiving in the seriousness of what it is. That understanding that it is time out for serving others that will not serve us, that will not die for us. It's time out for dying for those who will not die for us. This message is about clarity and about understanding. This message is about understanding that life is short. And with each passing day is a closer day to death. So I pray every leader that hears this message will understand it in its totality. I pray that everyone, God, would really listen to what's being said and hear the depths of what you're speaking. When serving others is robbing us of life, but you want us to have life in that more abundantly than there's a problem. In 2020, there must be balance. In 2020, there must be decisions made to live and not die. And I pray that this message this morning, God, as it's being replayed, as it's heard by others, will be a message, clarity for those who have been saying, God, I need to hear a word from you because this is that word. Bless your ears to not only be hearers, but also to be doers. This I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen.